Open the session. Welcome back, everyone. This is a, a very exciting opportunity to have all of these amazing scientists on this panel. And Jude Carroll is going to be acting as the chair and introduce people as, as well as one of our star speakers. Thank you, Jude. Yeah. All right, um, welcome back everyone from that short break. So after those wonderful talks on biomarkers of aging, um, we're going to now start our discussion of applying these measures in biobehavioral research. So our symposium titled Biomarkers of Aging and Psychological and Behavioral Influences will involve talks from Avshalom Caspi, who will be joining us online to discuss stability of biomarkers. Martin Picard will then discuss mitochondrial measures and the relation with psychological stress. Then I'll discuss the relationships of sleep with biological aging markers. And then Eli Putterman will discuss exercise and exercise interventions on cell aging. So first up, we'll hear from Av Shalom Caspi, who is joining us remotely. Uh, at, uh, Dr. Caspi is the Edward M. Arnett Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Duke University. He works in the area of life course epidemiology and developmental psychology, and is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Distinguished Scientific Contributions Award from the American Psychological Association, and is one of the most highly cited researchers among the top 1% worldwide. We are thrilled to hear from him today. So go ahead and take it away. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. You can, all right. Am I able to move my screen? I cannot move my screen, my slides. All right, I think they're gonna try to help you. Okay. Um, apologies, I can see my slide, but I can't control it. Try clicking. Yes, I am. Ah, okay, there we go, thank you. We're set to go, thanks very much. Uh, and apologies for not being able to join you in person. Um, you know, I love new tools, uh, in fact, we all do, and that's why many of us are now importing advances in engineering and neuroscience uh, and in genomics to improve our psychological research. Uh, new methods are, of course, uh, alluring, but all that glitters is not always gold. And what I have uh, been granted is 10 minutes to share a cautionary and I hope a constructive message about a really boring topic, uh, reliability. Now, historically, more than any other um, discipline, psychology has subjected its measurement instruments to extensive reliability and validity studies. And part of the reason I suspect has to do with the fact that over 100 years ago, psychology shifted from using brass instruments to study objective differences between people to using rating scales to study increasingly, uh, to quantify increasingly sort of subjective differences between people. And that heritage has remained an integral part of uh, psychology. But when we import new tools from different disciplines. We don't always subject them to the same evaluation standards. And what I'd like to do is share with you some lessons that I've learned in our research program, and, and I hope it resonates. Uh, I'm going to illustrate with research using fMRI and DNA methylation, uh, but lest any of us get complacent, I could also just as well speak about gene expression or about telomere length or about EMA apps or any number of other measurement tools that are being imported into psychological research. So let's begin with fMRI. Uh, bold fMRI was introduced about 30 years ago, and since then, countless tasks have been developed uh, in an effort to uh, elicit activity in targeted brain regions. And these developments have led to uh, important insights about the brain, uh, for example, about the role of amygdala in processing threat. These robust group differences have also raised the possibility that if a brain region 
um, activated, is activated during a particular task while people are performing a particular task, maybe individual differences in activation also underlie individual differences in behavior. Uh, and the question then is really, well, how reliable are the individual differences um, that are measured using task fMRI data? And what we did was to, turn, as to answer this question is we used data from two studies, the Dunedin study and the Human Connectome project. Uh, in each study, participants were trained um, or rather were scanned while performing various uh, tasks intended to elicit activation of different regions of interest, uh, like the amygdala or the hippocampus, and the participants were scanned twice, permitting us to evaluate test-retest reliability of individual differences in activation. Uh, and we tested the reliability of activation in the target region of interest for each task. So for example, here are test-retest correlations, uh, intra-class correlations in the Dunedin study for activation in response to a well-known emotion processing uh, task. The region of interest here is the amygdala, and it's shown in a black circle. What you can see is that the reliability is poor, um, which means that the task does not activate the amygdala to the same extent in the same people over a short time interval. And what you can see also are all the other circles here, where we also evaluated the reliability of activation in other regions of interest. And what we were trying to do here was really test whether the reliability of the target region of interest, in this case, the amygdala, uh, was higher than the reliability of activation in other non-target uh, brain regions. And what you can see is that the reliability of the target region of interest was no higher than that of uh, observed and control regions. Uh, this is a task uh, that is supposed to measure individual differences in emotion processing in the amygdala. Uh, we extended the analysis to other tasks that are supposed to measure individual differences in reward processing, uh, in executive control, uh, and in memory. And what you can see is that these did not yield reliable individual differences. To provide a benchmark uh, for evaluating the test-retest reliability of uh, uh, task fMRI, we also investigated the reliability of commonly, commonly used structural uh, MRI measures. And here I show you cortical thickness and um, uh, surface area. And what you can see is that both of these F structural MRI phenotypes have excellent reliability. And to make sure that we weren't doing anything wrong in the Dunedin study, we repeated all of this using data from the Human Connectome project. And here we also observed comparably poor test retest coefficients when trying to measure individual differences in task uh, fMRI data. Uh, in addition, we also performed a meta-analysis of studies that included test, all the studies that we found that included test retest reliabilities of task uh, fMRI activation. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, the average test um, um, retest coefficients are poor. Uh, a moderator analysis did not find any evidence that this estimate was moderated by task type, by task design, by task length, by test retest interval, uh, by region of interest, uh, or by sample type. For those who are curious, uh, methodological details are found in our uh, reports, and we've also pre prepared a uh, short video that explains uh, the mystery of how it is possible uh, for us to observe significant group level activation of a brain region, but still end up with unreliable data about differences between uh, people. Uh, the bottom line here is that um, analyses of individual differences in activation of specific regions of interest using task fMRI data may not be so reliable. Let's turn to DNA methylation. Um, DNA methylation, as, as, as um, um, uh, most of you know, is an epigenetic mechanism that results in modification of genetic function without changes to DNA sequence. Uh, and it occurs at specific sites across uh, the genome, and there exists hundreds of thousands of such sites. And importantly, advances in technologies for quantifying site-specific DNA methylation have led to a huge uh, explosion of research that's aimed at identifying associations between methylation uh, variation in numerous environmental exposures and disease processes. When we began to produce DNA methylation data, we reviewed the literature seeking to find best practice information and guidelines. And what we were surprised to find is that a lot of fundamental information was actually pretty hard to find. Uh, 
Uh, for example, there was little information about whether uh, repeated measurements of the same DNA sample would actually yield the same results. Uh, and given that commercial products are also often updated and refined, there was little information about whether or not different products that are measuring um, the same thing, uh, namely extensive methylation, would produce ex equivalent results. So for example, the 450K uh, bead chip is no longer available uh, through Illumina uh, and has been superseded by their uh, EPIC uh, chip. So how reliable are DNA methylation data? Well, to answer this question, uh, we studied 350 DNA samples. Uh, DNA was sourced from a single blood draw using a single extraction and assayed twice. Uh, the DNA uh, here uh, came from uh, 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 some of the uh, twins who were enrolled in our environmental risk study. Uh, poor or probe rather reliability uh, was defined as the uh, intraclass correlation between uh, repeat measures of individual uh, probe beta values measured on uh, the two bead chips. And we calculated intraclass correlations for about 450,000 autosomal uh, probes that are present on both the EPIC and the 450K uh, bead chip uh, and which passed quality control. And here is the distribution of the reliabilities of the probes. Uh, probe reliabilities were skewed towards zero with a median of 0 0.09. Okay, so we have a reliability problem. Uh, and it's not an inconsequential um, um, problem. Unreliability has implications for uh, integrative genomic analysis, for exposomics, and for studying disease uh, processes. And, and I want to show you just one example uh, here. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of interest in cross-tissue uh, generalizability, namely does DNA methylation measured in blood also relate to DNA methylation uh, measured in, uh, say, brain. Uh, and what the violin plots here show you are the reliability of probes that have low blood-brain correlations in DNA methylation, these are in pink, uh, of um, probes that have medium blood-brain correlations uh, in DNA methylation in green, and those that have high blood-brain correlations in blue. And the four panels uh, show DNA methylation uh, in, uh, from four different brain regions. Uh, and, unless you're concerned, these, these data are not from our e-risk participants. Uh, they're from uh, four dissected brain uh, regions and matched pre-mortem blood samples from the uh, MRC London Neurodegenerative uh, Disease Brain Bank. Uh, but the point of this slide is that the probes that showed high blood-brain concordance in all four brain tissues were the most reliable probes. So if our goal is robust, replicable, biological inferences from site-specific DNA methylation, it seems really important to restrict analysis to those probes that in fact can be reliably uh, measured. Uh, more details are provided uh, in our report in the Data Science Journal Patterns, uh, and we've also made the reliability data um, uh, for each probe and all the probe characteristics available uh, for uh, the research uh, uh, community uh, through the open science framework. So why should you care about this? Uh, well, unreliable data produce lots of false positives and unreplicated findings. You know, makes sense, right? You can't really reproduce unreliable data. Uh, equally concerning though, and something we often forget, is that unreliable data are also likely to generate an unknown volume of false negatives. That is, unreliability constrains our ability to, in fact, detect associations. And that's uh, the point of this power uh, analysis on the right-hand side of the slide. What has been the response to um, this work? Um, I, I think to sum it up, there have really been two common responses. One response is, well, we already knew that. Uh, and, and I think that's slightly disingenuous. Uh, to be sure, every club has its internal concerns and its um, kind of secrets, if you will. But if all this was in fact already known, uh, we wouldn't have had to do all of this work to get the answer. Uh, a second response is we're working on it. Uh, and that's good. 
Uh, indeed, our group is doing that too. So for example, um, in, in fMRI research, we're using several new multivariate methods uh, that have been proposed to increase uh, the reliability of task fMRI measures by uh, exploiting the high dimensionality uh, inherent in fMRI data. And likewise, we're working with information about the reliability of probes in our methylation uh, data. Uh, but these, I have to say, are um, I'm stuck here. Um, it will not let me go forward. Um, but these are, um, in fact, often, um, there we go. Uh, they're after, uh, often afterthoughts, um, uh, you know, after data uh, have been uh, discovered to be unreliable. And the point of this uh, cartoon here is to simply document how we often uh, carry out a sort of post uh, hoc analyses of our unreliable data. Uh, what I'd like to suggest is that we actually need to get ahead of producing unreliable uh, data. The past decade, uh, I'm stuck again out there, yeah. The past decade uh, of meta science has drawn attention to uh, three Rs, uh, reproducibility, replicability, and robustness. Uh, reliability is really at the heart of it all. Uh, and we need to elevate this rather boring uh, kind of pedestrian concern, I think, um, uh, to a higher uh, level of interest. Uh, in terms of training, uh, many psychology training programs have dropped courses in psychometrics and in test theory from their curricula. And in fact, neuroscience and computational biology programs have never had them in the first place. Uh, they need to be instituted in order to train the next generation of scientists. Uh, in terms of funding, at minimum, we need to be building reliability studies into our grant applications. And unfortunately, when budget cuts are mandated, even the bare minimum measurement work uh, tends to be uh, axed. Uh, and in terms of reporting standards, we need to be writing better method sections uh, more transparently so that data reliability is obvious and repeatability of observations is fully uh, disclosed. In an age of increasingly big data, of widespread data sharing, and of increasingly sophisticated tools that we're borrowing from other uh, fields, there is a growing disconnect between data producers and end users. Many analysts simply have no idea whether the data they work with are in fact reliable, that is repeatable. Conducting analysis with unreliable, with rather with reliable uh, data will improve the chances of replicable uh, findings, something that we're all very concerned about, uh, which might also lead to more actionable targets for further research. And also importantly, to the extent that reliable data improve replicability, the knock-on effect is going to be more public confidence uh, in research, which we need during our kind of living through a reproducibility crisis and also less effort, in fact, spent trying to replicate findings when they are bound to fail, if unreliable to begin with. Um, so boring, I hope, is actually kind of interesting. Um, thank you. Wonderful, thank you um, so much. So are we're in interest of time, we'll wait um, to take questions to the end um, of the, the series of talks we have. And um, if, if you are online, you could put your questions in there and hopefully um, Dr. Caspi would stay online and respond to those. Mm -hmm. So that would be fantastic. All right, so next up we are going to have uh, Martin Picard um, who, uh, is an associate professor of behavioral medicine in psychiatry and neurology. Martin initially trained in neuroimmunology and received a PhD in mitochondrial biology of aging at McGill University. He then completed his postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for Mitochondrial and Epigenomic Medicine with Doug Wallace and worked closely with Bruce McEwen at the Rockefeller University before joining the faculty at Columbia University. His laboratory now investigates mechanisms of brain-body communication with a focus on mitochondria. His team and their collaborators run projects ranging from organelle to organism, including the development of laboratory assays to quantify the mind-mitochondrial connection. 
He was one of the Rising Star Lecturers at NIH, received the Early Career Impact Award from the Federation of Associations of Brain and Behavioral Sciences, and the 2019 Neil Miller New Investigator Award from ABMR for his work on mitochondrial psychobiology. Martin. Jude. Yes, does this work? Um, thank you. This is really great to be part of this session and to be following um, this morning's two plenaries on um, on DNA methylation and, and biomarkers. So, um, on DNA methylation and, and biomarkers. So, I was asked to do two things. Uh, one is uh, to talk about how mitochondria relate to other aging biomarkers, and then the second is to talk about some of the biomarkers that we're trying to develop. And uh, I guess the first part is, you know, why are mitochondria? Why am I a mitochondriac? And why do I think about mitochondria so much? So the slides aren't moving forward. Okay, great. Um, so the the basic idea, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, uh, is that energy is essential to fuel life processes. And everything we think about from gene expression to putting a methyl group, removing a methyl group from the DNA requires energy. And having the heart beat faster also requires more energy, making hormones, and so on. Sorry, there's a bit of a disconnect between the two screens. So this is a schematic of a cell. Uh, we have trillions of them in our bodies. The mitochondria are these little orange squiggly things in the, in, in the cytoplasm there. And if we look at this through an electron microscope, this is actually what a cell looks like. Blue is a nucleus, uh, where the beloved uh, telomeres, this is a LSS telomeres uh, chromosome and with the, the red telomeres at the end. Uh, in green is a cytoplasm. And then the outside world is the pale green. And then you see these brown orange mitochondria in the cytoplasm, right? So we think a lot about how does stress get inside the cell and then all the way inside the cell nucleus to change gene expression and epigenetics. Mitochondria physically lie between the outside world and the inside world. Next slide. Um, so here we ha we we're looking at uh, an even. Next slide, please. So and, and even we're just the the bottom line is mitochondria are very close to the nucleus. So physically they're just positioned right there to influence the epigenome. So we wanted to study this uh, using a cellular model. And as we've heard about, it's hard to do longitudinal studies. So we we thought let's do a longitudinal study in the dish, right? So we can take cells from individuals and then age them, very similar to what Steve uh, presented this morning. So Gabriel, uh, a a tenacious and courageous uh, student in our lab uh, tried to do this for a 10 month period. So you take someone's cells, put them in a dish, and then you just age them for 10 months. Turns out using the epigenetic clocks uh, and the, some of the markers that uh, Steve presented showed that these cells age about 70 times faster when they're in the dish than in the human body. So something happens when you isolate cells from the organism, they start to age faster. And then what Gabriel did was to do a multi-omic study. Uh, so you, we can collect DNA and look at DNA methylation, telomere length, and other things, RNA to look at gene expression doing, using RNA sequencing. And then we can look outside the cell at factors that are secreted that are, uh, of course, relevant for aging biomarkers. And then what we can do in the lab is do an experiment. So we can control everything and then influence one thing. So we change mitochondrial function. So we take the mitochondria from their healthy orange state to their sick red state. So we did this with three kind of mini cohorts. So we have three people, uh, female cells and male cells. And then either we don't, we just let them age normally. That's the control, the gray group. The blue is a genetic perturbation in mitochondria, cells that came from patients with genetic mitochondrial disease. And then purple is a pharmacological insult to mitochondria. So we manipulate the mitochondria and we ask what happens to those cells. So first we can look at gene expression markers of senescence. This is a cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor. And you can see in gray, as the cells age on the x-axis over about 150 days, on the y-axis is the expression of that senescence marker, and it increases over time. And in blue and in purple are the, the cells in purple from the same person, but where the mitochondria are not functioning properly. And you can see that that marker increases much faster. We looked 
in this heat map here, blue is high, yellow is, is lower. We looked at secreted factors of the senescence associated secretory profile or the SAS molecules, and it's elevated. And those include interleukin-6, interleukin-8, uh, GDF-15, which are classic markers of, of human aging. And then uh, Julin at UCSF uh, with Elisa measured telomere length in those cells. So again, this is a longitudinal data. So we can have, as the cells age on the x-axis, we have telomere length on the y, and then we can do a simple linear regression and we get the rate of telomere shortening. Every cell division, the theory is cells lose a bit of telomeres. What this experiment showed is that if the mitochondria are dysfunctional, how much telomeres is lost every cell division is one to seven times greater than in the control cells. And the effect size here is a Cohen's, uh, um, Hedges G of, uh, 1.2 to 3.2, so very large effect sizes. So having this functional mitochondria influences gene expression, secreted factors, and the telomeres. And then uh, we also looked at secreted factors uh, that are uh, outside the cells, including mitokine. So these are cytokines, but that are stimulated by mitochondria. And those increase by uh, one to two orders of magnitude. And then we looked at the methylome uh, using DNA methylation, the same EPIC chip, um, that Steve talked about, um, and that also Dan built his, um, his duty to pace on. And what we see here in this Disney plot is that perturbing the mitochondria shifts the whole methylone. And there are two examples here on the right where you see that in gray, this is a typical age-related decrease in methylation in one side, increase in the other side, and uh, showing that perturbation of mitochondria change DNA methylation over time. So how do we measure mitochondrial function? And... Uh, this is a, uh, it's, it's a bad question. And it's, it's analogous to asking, how do we measure human function, right? How do you measure human function? Or how do you measure physical function? It's too vague, right? How do you measure mental function? Still too vague. And how do you measure cellular function? It's also too vague. And it depends on which cell type you're looking at, right? Because cells have multiple functions. In the same way, mitochondria have multiple functions. This is what mitochondria look like when you look at them in a living cell. So you see these little squiggly spaghettis uh, talking to each other. So they actually have this social life inside the cell. They come together, exchange information, and then go away. They can fuse and, and uh, exchange their, their content. So mitochondria are complex, dynamic creatures that do a lot of things. So how do we measure different aspects of my, what we call mitochondrial behavior? And this is the analogous to the hallmarks of aging. These are the hallmarks of mitochondrial function <laughs> or the hallmarks of mitochondrial signaling. And uh, I'll just focus here on the energetics part of this um, and on the secreted DNA part of it. And I just want to point out also mitochondria in the cell is the warmest part of the cell. That's where the heat comes from and at the, at the intracellular level. So to look at whether we can map changes in mitochondrial function in people, uh, we need to develop good tools. And the tools that have been used so far are mostly used in cell mixtures, PBMCs, right? Peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So we assembled a small cohort of 21 people, half women, half men, uh, relatively ethnically diverse. And then what Shannon did with Caroline was to draw a lot of blood, about 100 mils. And then we do flow cytometry, purify different cell subtypes. So we have pure, uh, relatively pure the types of cells, and then we deploy our mitochondrial phenotyping platform. So we can measure not just one thing about mitochondria, but here five things, which is still not a lot, but <laughs> better than one. And then what we're seeing here on this graph is mitochondrial DNA copy number, how many copies of mitochondrial DNA there are per cell, and then on the x-axis are different cell types. And these are the results. Right? So mitochondria uh, vary dramatically between different types of cells. So the B cells that are the antibody producing cells have the highest number of mitochondrial DNA per cell. Uh, the neutrophils have the lowest, and then you can see the naive, the memory uh, cell types and the monocytes. And in relation to aging, because that's of, of interest to, to this meeting and a few people here, then having this cell type specific data, we were able to ask, is there a correlation between copy number and aging? And what you see here is that Overall, across all cell types examined, except the one cell type, there is a positive correlation between age and mitochondrial DNA copy number. So the older people are, the more copies of mitochondrial DNA they have per cell. And one potential factor to explain this is because the mitochondria uh, are less efficient as we get older and therefore try to compensate, right? So that's well known uh, uh, to be a compensatory upregulation of mitochondrial 
biogenesis and DNA replication that happens in, in some diseases. There's, uh, uh, in, in, I want to point out in studies of cell mixtures, what people have, in, in whole blood, which is uh, very difficult to interpret, people have reported decreases with age. Uh, so taking a cell specific approach, uh, I think is a, a very important thing to do as we move forward. And interestingly, the only cell type that does not show this age related a uh, positive correlation with mitochondrial DNA copy number is the one cell type that diminishes dramatically as people age um, and probably marker of immunosenescence. So the second question I wanted to ask was, how does mitochondria change over time? And there is practically zero data on this in, in humans, which is um, problematic. And is mitochondrial behavior stable over time? Uh, how much do different behaviors vary? And then in response to what do they change? So again, we, get, we did here a proof of concept study. Uh, we recruited a highly compliant participant uh, who had daily measurements of a number of things and then weekly measurements on the Fridays with the standardized breakfast at 9 a.m. Uh, with standardized physical activity. And then we did the whole panel and the mitochondrial phenotyping. So this is the, the data that I showed earlier. Here is for a marker of mitochondrial content, how many mitochondria there are in the different types of white blood cells. And then here is the data for six different cell types in this same person across nine weeks. And what I wanna point out is here the dynamic range in this marker of mitochondrial content uh, for the CD4 naive T cells. And you can see on the left for across the 21 participants and then on the right for the single participant, right? So the variation for this one person is more than half of the group. And then if we look at the variation for monocytes, you can see that monocytes in the, at the group level have higher mitochondrial content than the other cell types. Same thing in this person, uh, but here the dynamic range in this person is actually greater than the dynamic range across 21 people, right? So a single measurement uh, in a given person is unlikely, uh, I, we think, to provide a robust and uh, stable estimate of mitochondrial function in one person. And I wanna point out here between week seven and eight, that person went for a two week vacation. Uh, so maybe what happened at the two last time points re are reflective of some behavioral changes. So that's suggesting that the, the variation in mitochondrial health from a less healthy to a more healthy state, you know, could be influenced by exposures, by health behaviors. Eli is going to tell us about uh, exercise. Jude is going to talk about sleep uh, and potentially that might influence the things that I talked about earlier, the other hallmarks of aging uh, that we showed experimentally are responsive to mitochondrial function. And the last piece that I'll go quickly over is cell-free mitochondrial DNA, which is not properly measuring the behavior of mitochondria, but it's measuring an output, a signal that comes from mitochondria. Uh, some of you might have heard about cell-free stuff, cell-free DNA. It's actually used for, for early diagnostics, uh, pre-implantation diagnostics, and so on. So here's a schematic. You have cells at the bottom. You see their mitochondria, the nucleus, and then there's in the, we're, we're in the blood. We're in a blood vessel, and there are mitochondria and pieces of mitochondrial DNA that are floating in the blood. Why cells do this? Not quite clear yet, uh, but what we know is that higher cell-free mitochondrial DNA is observed in aging, is observed to uh, predict ICU mortality, intensive care unit mortality, uh, higher in mitochondrial disease and patients with Parkinson's, people after uh, a suicide attempt and with major depressive disorder also seem to have a higher cell-free mitochondrial DNA. So it might be relevant. So we wanted to know, okay, if, if it's a relevant marker of mitochondrial behavior, how stable is it? And can we use this in, in our studies? So we teamed up with Anna Marsland, uh, a, three years ago now, uh, and uh, Jude had the great idea to look at cell-free mitochondrial DNA and the study that she had participated in when she was a graduate student in Anna's lab. And these are the results. We have here people exposed, uh, healthy adults exposed to a, a five minute tree or social stress test. And you have a measure pre, post, and then 30 minutes later. And what we see here on the left, every person is a line, uh, and then the group average is on the right. And these are the same people tested a month later. So acute psychological stress, five minutes of socio evaluative uh, stress seems to be uh, sufficient to elicit an increase in cell-free mitochondrial DNA and, and plasma. Uh, so that raised the question, is cell-free mitochondrial DNA more of a state measure that rep responds acutely, which this study suggests, and another study confirmed this, or is it more like a trait, a stable thing that will increase with age or uh, will be different between people. So Caroline uh, performed a, a systematic review of the literature and then compiled some data. This is from another study that showed that the intra-individual uh, variation in the, across a two, two, 
uh, over a two-day period is greater or at least equivalent to the inter-individual variation uh, across the sample of about 30 people. And then in our study where the measures were one month apart, the coefficient of variation from visit to visit was about 30%. So that suggests that it's not a stable marker. And if we think about putting this along a, a continuum of other measures, things that change very rapidly uh, within seconds or change things that change very slowly or not at all, like personality, uh, we th our best guess is that the cell-free mitochondrial DNA is somewhere here uh, that changes within minutes to, to hours. So we don't know how dynamic cell-free mitochondrial DNA over time is. And also there's a lack of standardization. And that's illustrated here in a meta-analysis of a few studies in, um, in the literature, where on the x-axis here is how quickly do you centrifuge your blood after you draw it, right? That's something that is kind of a, a no-brainer. You write a protocol, you take whatever the previous protocol did, and then you just apply it. A thousand G for five minutes or 10 minutes. Turns out, if you centrifuge faster, cell-free mitochondrial DNA is much lower. So you can see this, this trend here. And the y-axis is a log 10 axis. So there's uh, tremendous differences. And then we asked, could we sample this in saliva, which would make studies in children easier uh, and studies, yeah, uh, large epidemiological studies possible. So Caroline was very interested to do this. And then Shannon in the lab started to collect samples from uh, a few different study designs. Here, we sampled in the morning at awakening, 30 minutes, 45 minutes after awakening to capture a potential awakening response. And then at bedtime, uh, this is the cortisol awakening response, well-known uh, normal physiology. This is the cell-free mitochondrial DNA awakening response. The magnitude here uh, reached up to 100-fold, uh, the highest that we've measured. Uh, here on average, it's 17-fold in, in this. So this is one person measured across 53 different days. So repeated measure over, over time. Uh, and if we look at this in different contexts, we see that there's great variability of large magnitude. And there's also previous work uh, from uh, Andrew Steptoe's uh, um, work about 20 years ago now showing that another protein in the mitochondria was associated here with low income, social isolation, and psychosocial distress in the workplace. Um, so that... Uh, they were you know, much ahead of their time, but th this data kind of synergizes with what we're seeing. So overall, this is how we think about this. The experiences and the psychological states that we experience might trigger uh, responses at the mitochondrial level uh, that then uh, produce signals that are released in the circulation, and perhaps we can capture this. So in summary, I've showed you how mitochondria are central because of their role in energy production and in signaling to, to adaptation, they're dynamic, they're living little creatures in our cells. Uh, experimentally, we can show that they're upstream of uh, several aging biomarkers and mitochondrial behavior is also very complex and we need to take, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a construct for which there are multiple uh, different variables that we need to think about. Uh, different immune cells have very different mitochondria. We need to take that into consideration and they might change over time. Uh, and there's a exciting new biomarker, uh, potential biomarkers uh, that um, um, seem to vary very quickly in response to physiological changes and psychosocial changes. So I'll finish by thanking our, our wonderful group, Caroline here, who's uh, second from the left, has been doing a lot of this work. Um, and um, uh, Gabriel uh, did all of the cellular lifespan work uh, that we're currently collaborating with Steve on to, to extract more information about the changes in DNA methylation. So this is uh, the rest of the team. I want to thank Alyssa, who introduced me to this field about uh, 10 years ago when I was a, a graduate student and uh, brought me in. I had the chance to have a fantastic mentor, Richard uh, Anna. Thank you for, for the, the, the collaborations we've done together. I mentioned Zhu, who performed a telomere length measurements and the cellular lifespan studies um, and everyone else who's contributed, including Rebecca, who was part of the, the initial brainstorming for uh, putting together the, the cell subtype study. So thanks very much. this on? All right. Thank you so much. That was fantastic talk. Um, again, I'll hold on to those questions and we'll um, open up for uh, the, those questions at the end. Um, to, but in the interest of time, we're going to switch um, on to the next talk, which will be mine. Um, hopefully it'll show on the screen soon. <laughs>
So what, uh, I'm going to be talking about the role of sleep in biological aging. I'm going to give you a little bit of a um, definition of how I think about biological aging, and then we're just going to dive into some of the data that we have um, in terms of published work looking at how sleep and sleep deprivation affects the aging process. Hey, there it is. Fantastic. All right. Okay, so in, when we think about biological aging, we've heard a lot about it today, um, but I think it's important to recognize that the concept of biological aging um, centers around the idea of accumulation of damage. So it is a process of this accumulation of damage that's coming from a number of sources. Um, this is a classic paper um, that really outlines this process in detail. I mean, as you can see, there's um, sort of these primary hallmarks uh, that are the result of damage. So you have genomic instability, telomere attrition, um, you have epigenetic alterations, and loss of proteostasis. But then you have this response to damage, um, these secondary factors like by, uh, the mitochondrial dysfunction that we just heard about. Um, we also have a nutrient um, sensing dis deregulation and then um, over uh, a lot of damage accumulation, you get cellular senescence, um, one of these linchpins in the aging biology machinery, it seems like, um, and the senolytics that you might have heard about are the ones that target those senescent cells and actually remove them to reverse aging. Um, and then you have this integrative hallmark, hallmarks that sort of are at the end stage, you have exhaustion of stem cells and some altered uh, communication, and a lot of that is inflammatory. So if you study inflammation, you study aging. <laughs> Um, so we have a number of markers that we can look at to try to capture these processes. Um, P16 Inc. 4A being um, this marker of cellular senescence that we're really interested in, and then a number of inflammatory markers um, that look at sort of the, the profile uh, of the, both the senescence-associated secretory phenotype, but also circulating markers. Um, so just to remind you, you know, we're talking really deep diving today into sort of the cell um, and the biology of that and how that interacts with um, the aging, how it really contributes to the aging process. And I think it's important to know that all of these things um, ultimately lead to tissue degeneration, right? So we have cellular senescence and necrosis, this tissue aging, and then the ne necrotic um, cells, as well as the senescent cells are sources of the inflammation that then is, um, you know, related to these aging outcomes. And then we have um, both the system level declines that we heard about. Uh, so the pace of aging with the biomarkers, which is also, um, you know, captured with the allostatic load measure that a lot of you might have um, used in the past. Um, and then also, you know, these long-term outcomes that we heard about. So what's the role of sleep in all of this? That was the question that I had. And so we started this um, journey in my postdoc, um, having um, grown an interest in sleep, unfortunately should have started in uh, Pitt because um, I had Tika Hall um, to give me um, advice. But we, we really started looking at sleep as in a role in biological aging um, at the University of California, Los Angeles with Mike Irwin. So I think about sleep as sort of the opposite of the stress processes that we experience during the day. If we study stress, we also need to study sleep um, because sleep is that time when we're going to restore the body and we're going to be able to help remove the damage that's accumulated during the day. And so, so we can think about it as sort of the balance of the two. So not getting that enough sleep or having disturbed sleep or having, um, you know, time travel and having not, not the quality of sleep that you might, might like because your circadian rhythm is off can cause disruptions in this system. Um, and so when we look at the literature, you know, we have a lot of data um, that's now been published looking at sleep deprivation as an, a factor that activates inflammation um, as well as, um, you know, this sustaining wakefulness during the night if you're trying to force yourself to stay awake can activate the ner central nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system in particular. Um, and then, you know, the question was really, can we see that this um, process of aging at the biological level? Can we look at d DNA damage? Can we look at cellular stress um, and uh, telomere attrition? And would, would this be the kind of the mechanism that links to these um, aging phenotypes as well as risk for disease and death? 
In the mouse model that um, has studied this interestingly and um, really fed into the work that we chose to do was that um, they looked at, so the S, F line, if you can see, it's the second one, that's sleep fragmentation. And then if you move your eye over, you can see the TERT is telomerase. So the telomerase activity went down in the sleep fragmentation. And then p 16 4 a is senescence. Senescent cells accumulated in the sleep fragmentation condition. Um, it's much easier to see when I have a pointer, <laughs> but I don't think I have that today. So this was sort of the inspiration. So then we wanted to do this in humans. We um, asked them to come into the a laboratory setting where they um, had their sleep restricted. So what did, what did we do? Um, we had 29 individuals. Um, they're all in the older adults, but they all have pretty healthy sleepers. So when they um, had to restrict their sleep, we were ho hoping that that would have a biological impact. So they had an acclimation night and then a, a full baseline assessment. So second full night of sleep. And then in the morning, we drew the blood. The third night was the sleep restriction, um, which was uh, you know sleeping from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. So they had to stay up until 3 a.m. Then we drew blood. And then we had a recovery night to uh, see if anything happened in terms of improving their uh, biological profile by getting sort of a recovery night of sleep. So what we did was we measured um, the biological aging process using gene expression. Um, so this is a, a number of genes that we know are related to the biological aging process. First, we have senescence associated secretory phenotype or SASC. These are inflammatory markers primarily, and um, these are known to be secreted from senescent cells. We have the DNA damage response, which indicates that there's DNA damage that's occurred in the cells and the cells are active and trying to repair them. We also have cellular senescence. Um, so that's that marker p 16 e 4 a also known as CDKN2A. Um, and that was a marker of senescence, so the cells shifting into senescence. So we have those three. So what did we find? Um, we found an increase in the SAS genes after the sleep deprivation. So um, that morning after having slept only four hours, there was an increase in these inflammatory genes. Whoa. And then I think I just skipped there. Okay. Then we saw uh, increases in DNA damage response genes. So these were also um, increased after the sleep deprivation. Uh, and um, the, the p-values were not quite significant, uh, probably because our sample size. But we did see a sustained elevation in some of these genes, which was quite interesting. We also looked at that uh, senescence marker, uh, p 16 inc 4 a and saw an increase about 24 hours after the sleep deprivation is how we model it. And that's really consistent with DNA damage needing, needing to occur and push those cells into senescence. It can take two, 24 to 48 hours. Okay, so that was sort of our initial evidence for sleep deprivation. We also looked at telomeres. A number of others have looked at telomeres as well, linking it to sleep uh, disturbances and insomnia with telomere length. What we found in this cohort um, that those older adults with insomnia um, in particular had shorter telomeres, in particular those older individuals. So as there's increasing chronological age on the bottom axis point, um, you'll see the, the, the shorter the telomeres. We um, then said, well, why don't we ask this question in multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, which had two time points for telomere length, so we could look at telomere attrition over time rather than a cross-sectional study. Um, we collaborated with uh, Susan Redline, who had done the sleep assessments in this cohort, including polysomnography. And so one of the main findings from that study uh, was that these individuals who had uh, micro arousals during the night, which you can think of as sort of a lighter sleeper, um, they had more micro arousals of their brain during the night, had more telomere shortening over that 10 year time frame. So some uh, evidence that telomere length is impacted by sleep. Um, next, we teamed up with Steve Horvath and wanted to look at epigenetic aging um, and immune senescence uh, in the Women's Health Initiative study. In this cohort, um, we had oh, just over 2,000 uh, women, and these were the insomnia symptoms that they reported on. Restlessness, difficulty falling asleep, waking at night, trouble getting back to sleep, and early awakenings. 
Uh, you'll notice here in um, the distribution of the data, 80% of the women um, had some degree of insomnia symptoms, so one or more. Um, but if you look down at the bottom, the number of insomnia symptoms, about a quarter had uh, three to five. So what did we find? Um, we looked at, this is the extrinsic epigenetic age measure. This was before the second generation clocks. Um, so this was published prior to those. But we did have extrinsic epigenetic age and the intrinsic measure. This is the Hanum, um, if, if anyone's trying to connect the dots. Um, and so what you can see here is that with increasing number of insomnia symptoms, we see an older biological age using that estimate. We went back to the data after the publication and looked at phenotypic epigenetic age, which we see a very similar finding. We also broke down um, and dived into some of the estimates of cell distribution in this cohort. So we looked at uh, the CD8 positive, CD28 negative, CD40, CD45RA negative, which indicates um, the cell is either late differentiated or senescent. And what you can see here are the correlations with all of the different insomnia symptoms. And um, if they reported any, as you can see at the very bottom, there was a significant relationship with more senescent cells than those with more insomnia symptoms. Of course, this is cross-sectional. So, um, you know, there could be some reverse causality there. Uh, more research needs to be done for sure. Um, last but not least, we looked at um, sleep in postpartum moms. As we all know, at around um, six months, if you are a mom, you know how much sleep deprivation you have. Um, there's a lot of sleep disturbances in this cohort. And um, so what we wanted to do, we really focused in on sleep duration um, because there wasn't a lot of variation, but there in sleep disturbances, there was definitely in sleep duration. Um, some moms reported you know, six, seven hours and others were eight, nine hours of sleep at night. We were able to look at epigenetic age at 12 months. And we measured sleep at both six and 12 months. And what we found, um, this is with the IEAA measure, which is um, C4FS clock. You can see that the short sleepers, which is on the left, had an older biological age using this epigenetic age measure. Um, similarly, we found effects with the phenotypic age measure, which is uh, Morgan Levine's. And this is the same pattern where you had short sleepers had a much older biological age. Um, you can see that this is in the continuous in the middle, that this effect is it's not just if you um, truncate the data, it really is a continuous effect with increasing amount of sleep, the better you look in terms of your biology. The, we also derived the DNA methylation telomere estimate, which is one of these newer estimates of telomere length, which comes from the methylation data itself. Um, and we found a similar finding where telomere length um, was shorter amongst those with shorter sleep duration. So what, where are we at? Tom? All right, so um, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump through the last one, which really just looking at multi-system aging. And so whether or not an intervention to treat insomnia might improve that. This was secondary um, analyses and it's published. You can go look at it. But really what we found was that um, the multi-system aging scores looked better. So there was lower risk amongst those individuals who received the CBTI for insomnia. So they um, fell actually fell out of the high risk category. So that suggests that the, the treating this insomnia might actually be beneficial and slow down that aging process, at least at the system level. So that's what we want to do going forward. We really want to um, you know, continue to look at these intervention designs to see if we can improve sleep um, amongst individuals who suffer with uh, insomnia or insomnia symptoms to pr prevent aging related diseases. So make sure I want to thank everyone um, that I collaborate with as well as all the funding sources. Uh, in particular, Mike Irwin is very uh, supportive over the years, working with Steve Cole, Steve Horvath has been fantastic. As Teresa Seaman has also been a, a mentor and wonderful to work with. Thank you.
All right, so I am going to now introduce our next speaker. I think we got started late, so we're now running a little late. Hopefully, um, everybody can stay tuned. So um, Dr. Eli Putterman is next. Um, he's Associate Professor uh, in the Faculty of Education School of Kinesiology at the University of British Columbia and the Ca Canada Research Chair in Physical Activity and Health. He has won several early career awards for from our societies, including from the Society of Behavioral Medicine in 2014, ABMR in 2015, and ISPNE in 2018. He currently holds funding from several Canadian funding organizations, including Canada Institute for Health Research, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, and Veterans Affairs. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jude. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks, Alyssa, for including me in this symposium. Um, I, uh, I, I'm excited to present my work on an exercise trial uh, with cell aging marker telomerelength and telomerase. Um, I started off my work as, the post, as a postdoc and assistant professor at UCSF, having looked at the role of exercise in mitigating the relationship from an observational level uh, between uh, stress and telomere length and telomere shortening. And I'm just gonna be presenting the work that we've done that was an actual exercise trial. Uh, but first, uh, you know, I, I was mentioning that some of my earlier work was just observational work. And that by the early two, 2010s, there were a, an accumulation of studies already showing or looking at or being interested in the relationship between exercise or physical activity with telomere length. So physical activity is any movement of your body that leads to an increase in your metabolic rate and exercise is planned. It's, it's um, a planned and structured type of physical activity. So in this cross-section, in, in this meta-analysis, systematic review and meta-analysis published in 2019, they showed uh, across all these different studies that if you look at a continuum of physical activity, so people's bodily movement over time, there is no relationship with uh, shorter, with uh, telomere length. However, if you take the uh, the questions on physical activity and split people into physically active according to Center for Disease Control, uh, which is 75 minutes of vigorous or 150 minutes of moderate activity or some combination of the two, and then looked at them versus the people who are low active or inactive, there's a significant, uh, significantly longer telomere length in those who could be categorized as active versus those who are categorized as inactive. What's quite fascinating about all this research is that most of it is been cross-sectional and completely observational. Um, there have been a few studies to this, at this point that have been uh, exercise trials specifically designed to shift uh, telomere length, shift telomerase levels. And I'd say that our study was one of the first ones in there. It was the FAST study, the Fitness, Aging, and Stress study, uh, where we tried to improve the fitness uh, in family caregivers was supported by the NIH with my K99R00 study. So in, in this study, uh, what we did is we collect, um, had participants, of course, we enrolled them, we uh, had some pre-study blood draws, baseline questionnaires. They completed an ecological momentary assessment weeks uh, with uh, questions on affect and rumination uh, and a sense of control during that week, uh, repeatedly six times, uh, three times per day. Um, we also had them kind of do this run-in trial in week three where we asked them to just watch some videos online uh, and do some stretching and they had to report at the end of the night whether they did it in order to stay in our study. And then we had a UCSF clinical visit with a blood draw and also a cardio, uh, cardio um, uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. We then randomized our participants into a 24-week uh, study where they were either randomized to get support and to start becoming physically active or asked them to remain as physically less active as they are from at the beginning. And then they, we followed up with them at the end of the study. This is one of our participants with permission from him to use this slide uh, where we provided participants free memberships to the YMCAs and it was any YMCA that was near them. So we collaborated with all the YMCAs in, in San Francisco Bay Area, and we paid for their memberships for a six-month period, and our student or our team members would meet them at the 
why the first on the first visit and do goal setting and set up you know have conversations about facilitators and barriers so using a lot of motivational interviewing skills um, we started them off slowly with 60 minutes three times per week at their lower level of their heart rate reserve 40 percent so that's the low level of their moderate activity and over the next uh eight weeks kind of ramp them up to four times per week and and 100 minutes and then by uh, or 150 minutes so getting them up to that goal at the high end of the moderate level weekly when they completed their 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 workouts uh, they would report them to us and they were wearing acceler accelerometers at the same time so they uploaded their data to the ActLife cloud and we downloaded it weekly and we would send them these these outputs on like how they were doing so far and if they did really well we'd say congratulations you exceeded your 150 minutes and if they didn't and they only worked out let's say 10 minutes we said congratulations on doing 10 minutes let's have a phone call so we would then have have a phone call with them and complete some motivational interviewing um, uh, in order to uh, kind of work through some of the facilitators and barriers. We also would send them text messages several times a week to remain encouraged. So that's the motivational interviewing. So let me talk about some of the results. So uh, this was published in 2018 um, uh, in Psychoneuroendocrinology. Um, and uh, it was a very, I think the support that we provided these participants led to a nice 75% on average maintaining 150 minutes per week throughout the whole study. And if you look, if you kind of lowered the bar from 150 to 120, we had a, over an 80% sex success rate in maintaining physical activity over the study period, which is quite amazing because there were many people who told me, you'll never get caregivers to work out. They have no time and they just they just can't do this so I was very proud that we were able to sustain some activity uh, over this six-month period um, the main results demonstrated that there was an intervention effect between uh, those who exercise and those who are in the control group with the length of their telomere length and the, the change in the length of their telomere length so those who were in the exercise group increased in the length of their telomeres and those in the control group remained the same over that six-month period Um, so I'll start off with some of the red. We also showed changes. There was treatment effects in VO2 peak, which is cardiorespiratory fitness. Uh, there was a treatment effect for body mass index and treatment effect for perceived stress scale. So I'll unpack that for uh, cardiorespiratory fitness and perceived stress. Those uh, went up. Uh, so uh, VO2 peak went up in those who became exercisers, which is great. It's a good validation of our exercise trial. And the, they also decreased in their stress levels, whereas those in the weightless control group remained the same. And for BMI, the weightless control group continued to increase over that six-month period in their BMI, whereas those in the aerob aerobic group stabilized, which is very similar to a lot of other exercise trials showing that it stabilizes. So we did, oh, sorry, the big thing was that this whole study was around telomerase levels, but we did not find that telomerase activity changed over the six month period in either of the groups. So if it wasn't telomerase, what is it then? So we looked at our uh, complete uh, blood count, we looked at the percentage and the numbers, and we didn't find any changes in lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils uh, from baseline to follow up, and there were no treatment effects. They were all in, not significant. So, but there possibly could be some significant changes that happen within these subsets. So there is a lot of work showing, not a lot of work, there is, show, there is work showing that long-term exercise, chronic exercise, cleans out, and I'm putting that quotation mark, some senescent cells from circulation. A, a, a systematic review and meta-analysis just came out a few days, a few weeks ago in Aging Cell by Chen showing that uh, long-term exercise is related to lower levels or uh, uh, high, lower levels of senescent cell markers like P16 and P21. Um, even one single bout of exercise has shown to decrease the amount of these uh, of senescent cell markers within the blood. Um, there's also research showing that uh, exercise, long-term exercise, even a, an acute bout of exercise will activate naive cell production of T and B cells and also mobilizes these cells to come into the blood. So we may have just changed what type of cells are in the blood while we measured them. 
Uh, this is work by Julien uh, that was completed with some of Alyssa's other data showing that B cells have the longest telomeres um, of, the, of the different lymphocytes. And that kind of suggests that if we are pulling more B cells into the blood, that perhaps we are shifting just the average length that we're measuring, even though we're not changing the, the um, percentage or total number of, B of uh, lymphocytes. Um, the, another explanation could be the sheltering complex. So we've talked a lot about the uh, telomerase protein or the, act, uh, the activity at telomerase levels. Um, the sheltering complex stabilizes telomeres. Um, there are six proteins and there is research suggesting that exercise, even a single bout, will lead to an increase in the gene expression of these uh, proteins that are related to sh sheltering. Um, a few months after our study was published, a larger study in 250 people came out from Germany, from the Werner team, who have done some really beautiful studies on exercise and telomere length, showing that, uh, that exercise, six months of exercise, does shift telomere length and also shift a telomerase level, and that that telomerase level even happened within one single bout of exercise. Um, so even though we did not show telomerase, this Werner study did, did show changes in telomerase, and that was recently, all the different telomerase studies were just reviewed by Joshua Denham um, in uh, Aging Research Reviews, just published about two months ago, showing that there's an increase in telomerase levels and expression of the genes related to telomerase like TERT um, in uh, mouse studies and human studies from a single bout and long-term exercise. Um, this is, uh, so that's the end of that piece. So this is more of a shout out to like a study that we just published, but more of a request from people that if you're thinking about doing some interventions right now with any chronically stressed COVID related samples and you want to do some intervention work and see if we're sh you can shift mental health and also uh, some blood biomarkers and aging markers. We just completed, we, we just published a study in BJSM, British Journal of Sports Medicine, showing that uh, looking at the first few months of COVID, we implemented in physically inactive uh, Canadians, 334 Canadians, an app-based, mobile-based uh, at-home workout program for depression, uh, with depression, uh, but this was just community samples. And what we found was that across all the participants, uh, depressive symptoms did change over a six week period in those who are either receiving a HIT, a high intensity interval training app, a yoga app, or a combination of the two with the greatest effects uh, happening in those who received the variety of the different apps that were available to them. But what was really important is that the greatest effects on depression, depressive symptoms were not surprisingly, or actually it is surprising, um, that we had the greatest effects in those who if you categorize them as having high depression at the beginning of the study, the greatest effects were in those groups. And the reason I, it's surprising is because we were able to have them maintain a physical activity regimen prior to not having one uh, during that six week period in the first few months of COVID when everyone was under lockdown. And it's not surprising only because if you're not depressed, we can't really shift your depressive symptoms. Um, I just wanna introduce uh, just a final talk um, point. So we are doing some studies right now, looking at telomerase, looking at other aging markers um, in some made marginalized equity owed and hard to reach communities in Vancouver and Canada. So one of our studies is uh, rolling out a pan-Canadian study for ball hockey with veterans, uh, and it's a social, social group-based uh, study. We have another study that's a feasibility study trying to uh, engage uh, women who are living with HIV to become dance instructors, to then roll out a dance program for women living with HIV within their community. Um, I'm not a fan of the term socially disadvantaged, but the WHO uh, in 2013 did come out with a policy summary on like, how do you do research in made marginalized or equity owed or hard to reach communities? And they highlighted that if you want to increase the acceptability, the empowerment and the ownership within the target group so that you can sustain it for long periods of time, that you have to define the target group. You have to integrate peers from the group. So like we are integrating veterans to roll out the ball hockey program or the women living with HIV to become the dance instructors. Um, you have to test the feasibility and the acceptability. So you can't just jump in and be like, I have an idea and I'm going to do this, but you have to actually consult with the members of the community to really figure out what do they want to do. And a 
big part of it is that you have to target and promote the social connectedness between um, uh, and social inclusion between the participants. Um, with that, I'm just going to thank uh, many of my collaborators who are part of the studies that I just showed, uh, especially Alyssa, who's here, and uh, Zhu Lin's here, and Eric Prather and Evo Donovan. Uh, they uh, have been integral to uh, the work that I have done uh, over the past 12 years. Um, and then uh, my lovely, amazing team of students who are really furthering some of this research at this point now for me at UBC. Thank you very much. All right, I think we can open it up to a couple questions. Um, so come on up. Hi, Stacey Drury from Tulane. Um, first, I love the term ball hockey. Can I just keep that in my head forever? Is that soccer? Is ball hockey the same as soccer? Is ball hockey the same as soccer? Soccer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or is it different? So, so no. Oh, sorry. Can you yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so uh, the so, uh, ball hockey is just like playing hockey, but in a room with a floor. So you're okay. using a ball uh, okay. instead of, uh, but it's not soccer. Um, and the reason that we developed the ball hockey, we had originally thought it should be rugby or soccer, but it was through conversations with veterans in Canada. They were like, soccer, we like playing hockey. So it became a hockey thing that we were able to do indoors um in the mess halls so uh with the veterans and that's how it was developed i love the community engagement in the study design so i have a question for all of you first of all it's fascinating and have about a billion things in my head going on um but i have a question for all of you and i'm gonna rope in dan and steve as well when we talk about really looking at these aging markers right particularly the cell markers particularly during interventions my challenge to you is that the amount of variation that you are expecting to demonstrate an effect is biologically potentially not necessarily compatible with the time frame you're looking at, right? So if I were to think about telomeres, because that's what I know most, and I know, Martin, you like get a pass again, because like mitochondrial are constantly changing. <laughs> My question to all of you who are studying these cellular molecular markers, what is the stability of change in methylation at cytosines? And when I think about telomeres, right? So the estimated decrease in telomere length per year is 20 base pairs. We have no measurement of telomeres that can capture that type of resolution in a short intervention, be it six months, be it five years, over time. And so I challenge us to think about that as a really important component of how we think about study design. And my, I, what I don't know, so that goes to Steve and to Dan, is what is the expected rate of change or aging in methylation? And we don't have a good handle, particularly under the age of 40, of what the expected rate of telomere length change would be over time. And so as we think about this, and so I was really excited to see that you were talking about margination and changing in the composition of the age of the cell types you're looking at. But I really wanna challenge us to think about this as we both establish our norms, but also what does that do to our study design? I think that's a, a really important point. Um, and a few years ago in collaboration with Alyssa, Eli, uh, Eric, we did a study where we looked at the association between mood uh, based on an evening survey of the modified differential emotion scale and mitochondrial, uh, the mitochondrial health index, how much energy mitochondria can produce measured at one time. And with the beautiful design that uh, they had, we were able to look at whether mood predicted mitochondria or whether mitochondria predicted mood because it was daily measures of mood and then one measure of mitochondria. And what we found there was that mood the night before the blood draw predicted up to 12% of the variance in mitochondrial function the next morning. The, from a biological perspective, that is really surprising that mitochondria could move that much because you know 12% uh, in, from an energetic perspective can be the, the, the deciding factor whether you have enough energy or you don't, or you feel tired or not, or you have symptoms or, or not, especially in, in patients with you know, impaired mitochondrial function. So th that was really surprising. That's what's prompted us to do kind of a repeated measure weekly. And now we feel like we, we probably need to look even, you know, 
daily might not be enough if we want to truly understand the dynamic variation in those parameters. Um, and seeing that within 30 minutes, within 15 minutes, we see you know, an order of magnitude change in cell-free mitochondrial DNA in saliva, for example, is, is, is amazing. Um, so we don't know at this point how dynamic these parameters are, and we need to find out. Kathy Samoyoa, UCSF. Thank you all for your... Uh, this question is for Judith. I'm a fan of your work. And uh, my question is, or I guess my request is, your thoughts on um, sleep inequities and how that compounds with stress exposures um, on telomere length and other biological markers. I know you've done work with the MESA study. Um, in my mind, I think about this framework of how do we integrate all of these different exposures? And, and uh, I really appreciate your work looking at the balance between stress and, and sleep. Um, so any thoughts on that would be appreciated. I, um, I would actually ask Eli to men talk about his um, paper looking at combining a number of different parameters um, if you want to. Um, yeah, we, we published uh, in 2015 a paper showing that telomere length change over a one-year period uh, is unrelated to chronic stress over that year, unrelated to exercise or diet over that year or so, or uh, sleep, but that it was the combination of them that is actually uh, related to the change. So chronic stress was unrelated over that year, or actually not even chronic stress, the amount of or number of chronically stressful experiences that people reported over that year, they were related to shortening, shortening telomeres over that one year period for those who were not sleeping well, those who were not eating well, and those who were not exercising enough during that one year period. So there's some sort of like uh, um, deficiency or some sort of combination between all these factors that can lead to accelerated aging. And we've, that's kind of replicated with depression. We've replicated that over a five-year period with cardia, similarly showing that uh, all these different factors um, mitigate or change the relationship between chronic stress over time and telomere shortening. Yeah, I, I would uh, just add that I think that, um, you know, the interventions for sleep do target stress and anxiety um, as one element that contributes to the insomnia experienced. And so the CBTI in particular um, is an intervention that isn't just improving sleep, it's also improving uh, people's anxiety levels. So. So They're we're running connected. a little bit behind and we have a lot of praise as well as good questions on the Zoom chat. So we'll take the last question from Steve Horvath. And then if you, um, if you have time, you can quickly answer questions on the Zoom chat and other people who had questions, I'm sorry, we didn't have time, but we will have lunch. <laughs> How about that? Um, and so there'll be some time to continue to talk with the speakers, Steve. Just wanted to quickly answer the question about rate of change. Um, so the good thing about epigenetic clocks is um, they're in units of years, right? So in theory, um, a newborn has H0, a centenarian has H100, according to an epigenetic clock. And that also answers the question about rate of change, because if you let one year pass, epigenetic age will increase by one year. Now, um, epigenetic biomarkers, some of them are remarkably accurate when it comes to replicate measurements, H very high intra-class correlation, but they're still not good enough, you know? So um, people who um, generate replicate measures, like in my group, we still observe one or two years of differences just because of um, technical noise. So I always recommend collect two blood samples before the intervention. So you average out this effect. Um, when it comes to, um, there's another fact, certain cytosines really change from hour to hour. Um, cytosine methylation um, shows a um, circadian rhythm at some locations, you know, so it can be remarkably dynamic at certain locations. And then one shouldn't forget 
there are certain interventions that had a drastic effect on epigenetic age. I mentioned these uh, young plasma studies that rejuvenated certain tissues by 50%. I mean, that was just mind boggling to me. Unfortunately though, the interventions that are so interesting to us here, um, which is um, exercise or sleep, you know, they seem to have, even nutrition, they seem to have a very minor effect, at least in blood, you know. And so, unfortunately, one needs very large group sizes. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Caspi, are you on? Did you want to add anything? I am. Uh, I, 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 the one thing that I want to add, I don't know who asked the question about the temporal variation. I want to applaud that question because I think that really gets to the heart of um, uh, many um, the, you know, troubles that we have in developing these tools. Um, uh, temporal variation is something that we don't know much about. Uh, equally, you know, we don't know much about seasonal variation. We don't know much about diurnal variation for many of the bio uh, markers and many of the tools with which we're working. Um, you know, descriptive work is sort of not terribly exciting work um, to do, uh, but it's essential in order for us to have have a framework against which to evaluate the changes that we're looking for. Um, so I, I, again, I wish to applaud that question because it's so vital to the entire enterprise that we have the appropriate background information against which we can uh, evaluate our measures. Great, thank you. All right, well, I'll go to lunch now. <laughs>